Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Rails to Trails Conservancy's Trail Expert Network. My name is Eli Griffin. I'm the Manager of Trail Development Resources here at RTC, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Our topic today are the legal, excuse me, the legal issues affecting Rails to Trails conversions. I will open with a brief overview of rail banking, but our future presenter is Andrea Furster. Andrea is a lawyer in private practice here in Washington, D.C., but since 1992, RTC has been fortunate to also have her serve as our general counsel. Among many other areas of expertise, Andrea is one of the nation's foremost legal experts on the legal framework governing rails-to-trails conversions, and she will lend some expertise on the subject today. While we intend this webinar to help inform the great work that you all are doing in your communities, we'd like to make it clear that the information presented in this webinar is not legal advice and is not to be acted on as such. The webinar will not present an exhaustive discussion of applicable case law, and the applicable legal authority is subject to change without notice. And now for our usual housekeeping items. First, as you've probably already noticed, attendees will not be able to speak during today's webinar. All attendees are automatically muted as they join to keep background noise to a minimum. We'll be keeping an eye out for any tech problems that may emerge on our end, but we will be unable to help with any individual tech issues. If you experience any such problem, your best course of action is to contact GoToWebinar's free customer support directly or view a selection of help topics at the link shown on the screen. I encourage you to copy those links down now before we move on from this slide. If for whatever reason you lose the webinar connection, please re-click your login link. You will be able to rejoin the ongoing session at any time. And we are recording this webinar, so worst case scenario, you'll always be able to view it later. If all goes according to plan, we'll have time for Q&A at the end of Andrea's presentation. If you have any questions about the legal issues affecting rails to trails conversions, please type them in the question box on the right-hand side of your screen at any time. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but if we don't get to yours, or if any questions come up in the future, you'll find contact information for Andrea at the conclusion of this webinar. And finally, after today's webinar, you will receive a follow-up email containing a survey asking you to rate our performance on today's webinar, more information about RTC's Trail Expert Network with a link to sign up for occasional email notices from us, and most importantly, that recording of today's webinar. So before I turn it over to Andrea, we thought it would be helpful to give a brief overview of rail banking. Much of the work that I do at RTC involves providing technical assistance to trail managers working the rail bank corridors in their communities. While only a fraction of all rail trails are rail banked, the bulk of our presentation today does focus on rail banking. And that's for two reasons. First, as you can see from this slide and the one I'll jump to in a second, there, some of the most iconic rail trails in the country are open on rail banked corridors, uh, and that's not to mention the dozens more in development. Second, and more practically speaking, rail banking is really the best legal defense against challenges to trail managers, as Andrea will soon discuss. But what is rail banking? In short, rail banking allows for the interim trail use of a rail corridor while it remains under the Surface Transportation Board's jurisdiction. If rail service is ever needed in the future, a railroad can reactivate the corridor following a formal process with the STB. Rail banking was established in 1983 as an amendment to the National Trail System Act. At the time, Congress was worried about railroads abandoning their lines en masse, um, and they were afraid that they would lose those corridors for forever. So the uh, process I outlined just now was kind of the, the compromise that allowed them to keep railroads under, excuse me, rail lines under STB jurisdiction while allowing for interim trail use in the present. We describe it often as a pre-abandonment strategy, but really it's a pre-consummation of abandonment strategy as railroads need to file for abandonment uh, for the rail banking process to take place. And that is a voluntary agreement between the railroad and trail manager. So while there are methods to compel a railroad to abandon via adverse abandonment, it's really not recommended as you'll still need to get the railroad on board to agree to rail banking. As I just mentioned, service transportation board jurisdiction over the corridor is retained, which allows the line to be reactivated for future rail use, but allows it to be used for interim trail use in the present. And these last two points, uh, that rail banking preempts state law with regards to reversionary rights and that it was it has been successfully defended at the Supreme Court, will be covered in Andrea's presentation. So how does the rail banking process work? As I mentioned, the railroad files for abandonment. A trail manager files a request for the issuance of a notice of interim trail use with the STB and the railroad. The STB sees these requests probably almost weekly, 
Um, it's really just a form letter, and we have an example available on our website um, that's been used in the past and, and has worked successfully. For rail banking to work, the railroad will need to agree to negotiate. If the railroad agrees and everything else is in order, the STB will issue the notice of interim trail use. And then that's the easy part. The, the harder part are the actual negotiations. Um, so this can take uh, years, months. Um, you, usually it's, it's longer than the 180-day initial period that's granted by the STB, but um, as Andrea will discuss, you can extend those periods um, as needed. So the negotiations that occur uh, basically will lead to any kind of normal transaction you would see. So a contract will be developed and signed, uh, the railroad gets their money, the trail manager gets the deed, um, and then the railroad will file that rail banking consummation notice rather than an abandonment consummation notice. And beyond that, the, the corridor is rail banked and there really are no ongoing responsibilities with the STB. Um, if reactivation were to occur, then obviously all the parties would be re-engaged, but there's no reporting requirement on the part of the trail manager. So why would trail managers want to pursue the rail banking route? Well, primarily it's because it keeps the corridor intact, regardless of how the land was assembled. Um, in the past, corridors are um, made up of a, a ton of easements often. So upon abandonment, those easements will revert to the adjacent landowners. Um, and often railroads don't even really know how the corridor was assembled. So rail banking allows it to stay in one piece um, and then allows uh, the trail manager to develop a trail on the entire corridor. It can often allow for an improved negotiating position. Again, the railroad often doesn't know what they own. Um, they may know that they don't own large chunks of it or, or that it's uh, formed from easements and that they'll lose the land and won't have anything to sell. So for trail managers, their negotiating position is strengthened because they'll be dealing with just the railroad for the entire corridor. And that, of course, could result in a potentially lower purchase price if you can successfully convince the railroad um, of your strength in negotiating position. And what I mean by occasionally allows for no or low cost corridor improvements by the railroad, um, railroads generally salvage their own lines. In the past, line buys were maybe not common, but would occur with more frequency. Uh, they rarely occur now, and that's when um, the railroad will leave the, the track material and other materials in place and the trail manager can salvage it for uh, trail development value. But um, even with the salvage being um, occurring from on the railroad's end, they may grade the corridor for you. They may uh, remove some buildings that you don't want in their corridor anymore. Um, and really that's to the trail manager's advantage, a, a huge cost savings. And for railroads, it's really the flip side of that in terms of the negotiations. Instead of negotiating with a bunch of different landowners uh, to sell the corridor, they really only need to negotiate with just the trail manager and that can lead to significant reduced transaction costs. And again, similarly, they might not need to investigate how the corridor was assembled, resolve any ownership issues or respond to litigation that may occur. When a railroad salvages the line, they'll often need to demolish any particularly trestles, but tunnels, any um, outbuildings that may be in the corridor, depots, stations, um, just because they're huge liability concerns for the railroad upon abandonment. But these are the same kind of buildings and structures that are often really important to trail managers and they'll want them in place. And that's obviously a cost savings to the railroad. They won't have to spend the money to salvage or demolish them. We already went over that it preserves reactivation rights. Reactivation is a very rare occurrence. I think it's only happened a handful of times in the past. Um, generally, railroads won't go through this very expensive abandonment process unless they're positive. They won't need the line in the future, but obviously things happen, new opportunity emerges, um, and they, they may wanna reactivate in the future. So it could be a selling point to the railroad. And it can create goodwill in the community. If the railroad needs some good PR, um, if they haven't been viewed as a friendly neighbor uh, before, generally people like rail trails, people like trail development, even if they're selling the corridor and not donating it, uh, just this, just by making this trail possible, they can really create some goodwill in their community.
RTC does a number of things, uh, but in terms of this rail banking process, um, our role is outlined here. So we alert communities of upcoming abandonments via our early warning system. The railroads have a notification requirement. They have to serve it on uh, relevant parties, any intent to abandon, including on the state, various state agencies, um, local government, and they have to report it in a newspaper of record. Um, however, this uh, is basically usually just a little note in the classified section, and I don't know how many people are actually checking that every day. Um, so often nonprofits in particular, but sometimes local government, um, the first time they hear about an opportunity is through our early warning system. We provide technical assistance to trail managers and sometimes railroads as they navigate the rail banking process. We defend rail banking from legislative attacks and legally, as Andrea will discuss, and we provide trail building and management technical assistance post rail banking. So just, you know, tips on, on how to develop, um, how to negotiate, how to, um, what kind of amenities you might want. Um, and a lot of that can be found in our trail building toolbox, which I've included a snapshot of here. Um, and you, you can see the URL at the top of that page. Um, it includes a bunch of topics, including two pages on rail banking that goes a little bit more in depth into what I've been talking about here, but there are also a bunch of other pages on trail development, trail management. And then we offer legal assistance when needed at any stage of this process, which Andrea will outline now. Thank you, Eli. So I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes or so going through some of the key legal issues that affect rails to trails conversions including some current and emerging legal issues. And I'm going to start with the Surface Transportation Board, which is responsible for developing the rules and policies implementing the federal rail banking program. Eli went through the current set of procedures, which have worked well enough um, over the past 30 years and have allowed sufficient time to um, allow the parties, the railroad and the potential interim trail manager to negotiate a rail banking agreement. Um, but last November, the Surface Transportation Board proposed a rule change that the Rails to Trails Conservancy and, and many others have opposed, which would make it harder to extend rail banking orders for more than three years unless the trail manager can prove that there are extraordinary circumstances justifying the extension request. And previously, extensions were granted as a matter of course. RTC um, has a very extensive, in fact, the only um, most extensive database of all rail banking and rails to trails conversions. And our data, in fact, showed that a substantial number of trail use negotiations exceed three years for a variety of commonplace rather than extraordinary circumstances. Um, so we opposed this rule change and many others did as well. But one of the interesting things that RTC's data also showed was that the vast majority of negotiations took at least one year. Um, and, as, and as Eli mentioned, the initial rail banking negotiation period um, that um, is granted by the STB is, is six months. Uh, so what RTC has done is last Friday, we filed our own rulemaking petition, um, and we um, petitioned the STB to change its rules in a different direction from the, the pending uh, rulemaking proceeding to establish an initial one-year period for all rail banking negotiations instead of the current six-month period, which period could be extended for good cause shown. And um, we provided the docket number here on this slide. Um, the comment period goes until April 11th, 2019. So if anybody would like to submit comments, the period is still open. As Eli also mentioned, um, Rail bank quarters are available and must be available in order to be properly rail banked for future rail service reactivation. And while there are only a handful of um, cases in which 
rail bank rail corridors have been reactivated. A few of those cases involved um, contested proceedings, which result in, in STB decisions clarifying a couple of issues regarding rail service reactivation. Um, the first issue um, involves a case where the railroad demanded that upon reactivation, the trail manager give the railroad back the corridor for free, even though the railroad had in fact paid, a, um, sorry, the trail manager had in fact paid a substantial amount of money to the railroad um, for the corridor. And in this decision, um, the STB clarified that while the STB must vacate the need to upon receipt of a request for rail service reactivation, the actual terms of the property reconveyance from the trail manager to the railroad, including what compensation is owed to the trail manager, is left to the parties and, if necessary, to the state courts. And another case, very recent case, uh, involving um, reactivation, um, uh, two issues were clarified or, or, or made um, or made clearer than they were before anyway. The first is that, and this is important to know, that not just the abandoning railroad um, can reactivate rail service. Any railroad can come and try to reactivate rail service on the corridor that's managed now by the trail manager. And that has given rise to some reactivation requests um, by entities that really didn't, don't have the wherewithal to operate um, rail service on the corridor. And in this decision involving um, the East Side um, Trail in King County, Washington, the STB made clear that it may reject a reactivation request if the reactivating railroad cannot demonstrate that it has the financial capability to restart rail service. So specific issues affecting rail trails also arise before other agencies, such as the Federal Highway Administration. A few years ago, RTC joined its local partners in successfully opposing a request um, to the Federal Highway Administration that it exempt a rail trail from the federal prohibition on the use of all-terrain vehicles on rail trails that were acquired with uh, federal transportation funds. So we now come to the courts. And this is um, where I'm going to spend the bulk of my presentation because court cases have rather profoundly shaped the interpretation of the laws and policies affecting rail trials over the past 30 years. And RTC has been involved in many of these cases. I think Eli mentioned um, uh, the issues involving the ownership of railroad corridors as it pertains to negotiating for the acquisition of a rail trail in the, at the start of the rail banking process. Um, and this is one of the main reasons why the rail banking law was, in fact, passed. Um, most lawsuits over rail trails are, in fact, ownership challenges brought by adjacent property owners who argue that the railroad only acquired a limited easement, which, which they claim the railroad abandoned when rail service stopped and the ties and tracks are removed. And while the this is a legal question that depends on the specific language in the deeds, many of which are over a century old um, or may even be non-existent in the case of uh, corridors that are acquired by adverse possession. Um, uh, there are complicated questions involving state law that varies from state to state, um, and some of which uh, some states have not even clarified these corridors. So, um, these sorts of ownership challenges can really prevent a, rail, uh, a, a trail manager from being willing to invest in developing a trail that could be subject to this type of challenge. And that's where rail banking um, is most important. And what I'm going to do is go through in these next kind of, these next few slides, the different, um, the different ways in which um, ownership challenges have arisen. I'm going to focus primarily on ownership challenges in the context of rail bank quarters, but I will also touch on um, ownership challenges that relate to what's called federally granted rights of ways. That's rail quarters 
um, that were granted uh, through federal lands or um, acquired by railroads with federal, federally granted condemnation authority. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about challenges to non-rail banked rail trails. So starting with rail banking and the, the jurisprudence around that, it really begins with the 1990 U.S. Supreme Court decision in the Perceau case, where a unanimous Supreme Court held that rail banking was fully constitutional. Uh, it also addressed the claim by adjacent landowners that rail banking was a taking and held that these claims um, should could be adjudicated on a case-by-case -case base, basis through the filing of what's a compensation claim in the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, um, and that the availability of this remedy prevented the law from being found unconstitutional as a taking on its face. Now, the, eventually the question of how these compensation cases would be adjudicated um, wound their way through the courts and were resolved by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which is the federal, the federal appellate court that hears all compensation cases. And in 1996, in a, a, a deeply divided decision was issued, which decided that rails to trails conversions resulted in what's called a per se taking of any rights um, that the underlying landowner can demonstrate that they would have had under state law if the corridor had not been rail banked. This um, ruling has a couple of important take home points that we always emphasize uh, to um, entity potential trail managers who are interested in, in, in acquiring a corridor through the rail banking process. And the first is that a compensation claim does not have the ability to do anything other than award compensation to adjacent landowners. It does not um, alter or affect the trail manager's right to continue to use and develop the trail. And these compensation cases cannot be the basis for a legal challenge to the STB's approval of a rail banking order either. And the second important take home point is that the, it is the United States, not the trail manager, that is responsible for paying any compensation that is awarded to adjacent landowners in these cases. So since uh, takings cases don't directly impact trail managers, I won't go into detail about these cases except to say that the jurisprudence in the Federal Circuit has very much incentivized the filing of these takings cases. cases. And according to the U.S. Department of Justice, which defends these cases, there are now almost 200 of these what they call Trails Act takings cases, most of which are in the form of class actions that have been filed, some of which have been adjudicated, and millions of dollars in payments, most of which goes to the attorneys representing the class action lawyers, have been paid out. Very briefly, I'll just want to touch on the other uh, case involving rail trails that has gone to the Supreme Court, um, and that is the Marvin Brandt case, which went to the Supreme Court in 2014 involving federally granted right-of-way. And the issue in this case, which involved the, a rail trail um, in Wyoming's Medicine Bow National Forest, was whether the federal government or adjacent landowners retained the reversionary interest in right-of-way acquired under a particular type of federal land grant called the 1875 Act. And the Supreme Court ruled that the, that, uh, the adjacent landowners, in fact, held the reversionary interest. And we provided a little infographic on the side um, the upshot of this is that the impact of this ruling on rail trails is quite limited, uh, particularly if the corridor is rail banked. And that's why we work so hard to defend, protect, and promote rail banking, um, because rail banking is super title insurance. Um, I often call it your get out of court free card. It is a trail manager's ticket to streamline judicial enforcement um, of these quiet title challenges to rail bank corridors um, when, uh, when they are brought typically in state court. 
So over the course of several decades of litigation, we now have an incontrovertible body of case law that when presented to a court um, that is adjudicating one of these quiet title challenges to a rail bank corridor compels the prompt dismissal of these quiet title actions based upon principles of federal preemption that Eli mentioned and that are outlined on this slide. So if your rail bank corridor is subject to an ownership challenge, we do have a packet of cases and sample briefs that we can provide to you that you can adapt and use to secure the lawsuit's prompt tra first transfer to federal court, which we recommend, and then it's prompt dismissal. We occasionally still have some courts that are outliers, and this is a case involving a rail bank trail called the Mockingbird Trail, which will be developed in Harper Lee's hometown of Monroeville, Alabama. In this case, even though the corridor was rail banked, the state court just decided to simply ignore the existence of federal law and they quieted the title to the adjacent landowner. The case is now before the Alabama Supreme Court and RTC is participating as a friend of the court. And in, this is a pair of cases from King County, Washington, where the adjacent landowners claim that federal preemption principles only applied to the portion of the corridor being used as a trail. And in this case, the corridor has an exceptionally large width and is being used as a rail with trail and a rail with pipeline and a rail with electric transmission uh, um, cor um, uh, corridors as well. And the Ninth Circuit rejected this claim um, and um, held that the rail banking statute and the protections of rail banking applied to the full width of the corridor, including the, 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 the portions of the corridor that are used for compatible rail and utility purposes. So I'm gonna skip through the next couple of slides but just simply say that the defense of non-rail bank corridors is much more, much tougher. Um, and it's very fact specific and the cases can be um, lengthy. They're filed in state court and they can be costly and, and, and time consuming to defend. RTC might get involved as a friend of the court in one of these cases if it addresses, uh, addresses an important policy issue involving the interpretation of railroad deeds or state law as it did in this case in Minnesota. And this is one of my absolute favorite cases. Um, and it uh, involves a corridor in um, Pennsylvania, the Armstrong Trail, that while it was not rail banked um, with using the procedures outlined by ELI before the Service Transportation Board was in fact declared to be privately rail banked. Um, and that is, it was rail banked without the Surface Transportation Board's involvement um, by virtue of a unilateral declaration of rail banking and um, a commitment to make the corridor available for rail service reactivation that was filed by the trail manager and recorded in the, uh, and, and recorded with the state court. And adjacent landowners challenged this, this um, um, uh, the, the trail manager's um, ownership through a quiet title action and the courts all the way up to the Pennsylvania Supre uh, Supreme Court held that the protections of rail banking apply to this what's called privately rail bank corridor, even though there's no need to um, because, uh, by virtue of the, the reservations and the deed that were recorded by the trail manager. So private rail banking is an option to be aware of in a couple of cases. First, as was the case in the Armstrong Trail where the railroad refuses to consent to the rail banking, but the railroad is willing to sell the corridor, or if the STB lacks jurisdiction over the corridor, which would be the case if it were perhaps a spur line or, or a former passenger rail. And I have a, I wasn't going to address liability issues, um, but uh, Eli says I have a little more time before um, we turn to the Q&A. So let me just go over this. You know, liability is a big concern. Um, for any trail manager, whether it's a rail bank corridor or, or not. 
and um, it could be the and and has been the topic of of its own webinar. Um, uh, but I'd just like to talk about two basic points um, that are important to be aware of when you're thinking about managing um, a, a rail trail and you're concerned about liability. So the first point has to do with rail banking. Um, uh, when you file a statement of willingness with the STB and you want to rail bank the corridor, you have to agree to assume all liability of this, of this over this corridor, which is um, a commitment that is, is required that you make in order to secure your uh, rail banking order, your need to. Um, but it's important to be um, aware that the requirement that you assume all liability the, over the corridor um, does not mean that you have to assume liability um, over past negligent or um, harmful actions by the railroad. Instead, you're agreeing to assume liability over the corridor going forward, and so that's a big issue um, when you're dealing with environmental liability, which many um, railroads might try to um, uh, argue that the trail manager should be responsible for, but which in fact are are and, continue, and should be the railroad's responsibility. And the second um, point that we always make um, in terms of liability is that there are in all 50 states um, important statutory protections um, to, um, to relieve trail managers from liability for personal injuries or damage on a, rail, on a corridor, whether it's rail banked or not. Um, and uh, those are called recreational use statutes. All, as I said, all 50 states in the District of Columbia have adopted some kind of recreational use statutes. And what these statutes do is they limit the liability of landowners who make their land available for public recreational use without a charge. Um, and the only circumstance under which the trail manager would retain liabilities is, is if it engages in um, actions that would constitute gross negligence or in, attempts to in, in, intentionally harm a trail manager. And then the last thing I'll, I'll say before we turn to Q&A is that RTC has a number of resources that are available on legal issues, one of which is our um, legal review um, that was published in 2017 on rails to trails conversions. And this is available on RTC's website on the resources tab. Of, of our website, and you, and you will find find that there, and you can download a copy of, of this. And it's a more extensive um, uh, a discussion of the legal principles and cases, um, many of which I have not discussed here um, uh, uh, on on the, the laws governing rails to trails conversions. So I will now turn it back to Eli, um, who I believe is looking at the questions that you have submitted, and we can um, try to uh, try to answer them. Yep, that's right. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, we kept the presentation um, as short as we possibly could to allow for this robust Q&A session, as I think the, the answers that Andrea gives here will help inform more, more than just the question asker. Um, so let's start with this great question we received from Chris Dawson um, that he submitted when you were discussing the takings cases. Um, so he says, it seems that most takings claims are resolved through payment of full fee value of property. Can you address why, if the federal government is paying full fee value, that they are not receiving fee title for the property? I really can't explain that because I find the jurisprudence governing these takings claims um, very um, hard to um, reconcile with sort of basic principles of law. But the principle is, is that um, the underlying landowner, uh, that, that, that the federal government is taking, in effect, um, you know, um, it's a new easement, and that new easement is perpetual easement, and so often um, a perpetual easement will be the same as the fee value. Um, the irony, of course, in these takings cases is that the, the federal government, while it pays the adjacent landowner for effectively the fee value, it the federal government does not get the deed for the property. If if the trail use um, ceases um, and the need to is vacated and no substitute trail manager um, is willing to take over 
responsibility for the corridor and the abandonment then becomes effective, then even after seeing effective, receiving effectively fee, fee level compensation from the United States um, in their takings claims, they still get the land back. All right, thank you. Um, and here's a question that just came in from Elizabeth Norton. Um, she asks if the trail manager of a rail banked corridor has to comply with state or local environmental protection laws knowing that the STB has jurisdiction? Yeah, that's a great question, too. And um, the answer is that it depends. Um, the STB has issued a series of rulings clarifying that even though principles of federal preemption um, do preempt any state or local law that would interfere with interim trail use, um, uh, that principle does not extend to um, reasonable laws that establish reasonable maintenance um, or, um, you know, other responsibilities on uh, public health, safety, welfare uh, responsibilities on trail managers. So it's a case-by-case -case question. There are um, cases where an, a, a responsibility could become so onerous on a trail manager that one could argue that it interferes with um, interim trail use and should be preempted, but um, if it's a reasonable public health, safety, welfare um, regulation, then there's some concurrent regulatory authority between that that that, that exists that allows these sorts of regulations. Okay. And John White wants to know if you're aware of an instance where a conservation easement was placed on a rail banked corridor. That's a, that's an interesting question. Thank you for that. Um, um, many um, many railroads um, um, in the past have sought to, to um, donate their interest um, in a um, in a corridor to a conservation organization, which would be an easement holder. Um, and um, and take a tax deduction for it, which is basically the main reason why that would be done, is it, why one would use an easement holder. There's a lot of um, tax issues that um, um, have made the tax deductibility of do quarter donations a little controversial. Um, but I do know that there are some cases where, in fact, um, um, railroad ease, railroad corridors have been subject to conservation easements, mo mostly because of the interest in getting a tax deduction from the donor organization, from the from by virtue of the the gift to the donee organization. All right. So Thomas Jones has a question about adverse possession and whether it's ever granted to an adjacent property owner. Uh, for using the property in the railroad right of way over a certain period of time. Another great question. A adverse possession, if it's a rail bank corridor, is preempted and unequivocally preempted. So, um, if an adjacent landowner try tries to argue that its ongoing use of a of uh, rail bank property um, has given it given it it writes to adverse possession, they cannot do that. Um, and they can't, certainly can't enforce it because of um, the principle of federal preemption that any kind of contrary ownership challenge, whether based on, um, based on state law adverse possession principles or other easement um, interpretation principles are preempted by the federal rail banking law. Now, I think there are maybe nuances in that when it deals with preemption, um, sorry, with um, adverse possession claims that um, nip at the um, excess right-of-way, you know, sort of outside um, the, um, the, the, the rail corridor. Um, um, I would argue that any, any claim of adverse possession within the rail corridor, even if it's outside of the hardscape of the trail, would be federally preempted. Um, but the best thing to do is to, um, you know, send a letter to the adjacent landowner that's encroaching on the corridor and asking them to cease and desist um, and take whatever action is needed to eject them. 
but but my my answer would be they're, they're all preempted if it's rail banked. If it's not rail banked, and you know, adverse possession law would um, be in effect, and um, and um, you need to go and look at your state law what the period is for being able to um, claim um, rights to property um, through adverse possession. They could be, you know, eight years. It could be 15 years. It could be 23 years. It, it, it varies from state to state. And make sure that you and you enforce them um, um, and 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 eject any encroachments. The alternative to ejecting encroachers is to permit the use um, because adverse possession has to be adverse. So if the trail manager actually enters into an agreement with an adjacent landowner, for example, that is encroaching on the right of way, but not in a way that interferes with trail use, then no adverse possession rights accrue by virtue of that permitted use. Great, thank you. And here's another question from Elizabeth Norton. Um, she's saying that title to underlying property is murky along a spur of a rail banked corridor and how the land was assembled. If it's now rail banked, is a lengthy title search necessary to determine who owns the land? Well, um, I'm, I'm going to assume that if the corridor is rail banked, that means that there's already been um, an agreement between the railroad and the trail manager um, for the transfer of the corridor via a quick claim deed, which, you know, it could mean that the title remains murky um, and that the trail manager um, simply owns what what the railroad owned, which could be nothing, right? And um, in that case, I don't, I'm not sure I see any particular reason why those underlying title issues need to be resolved because um, the, you know, if an adjacent landowner claims you you know that they in fact are the true owner of the rail bank spur um, it doesn't matter because rail banking is super title insurance and any claims that are adverse to the rail bank corridor are preempted so long as um, the corridor remains rail banked okay and i've gotten a couple questions here that i'm going to kind of try to merge um, and they both uh, touch on utility use of uh, rail banked corridors. Um, so you mentioned the two Washington cases, um, but let's start with Jonathan's question here. Um, he wants to know if STB regulations limit the ability of a, a trail manager to facilitate other uses of a rail banked corridor. So can you elaborate on the two Washington cases? Sure, and, and let me just start with um, the STB um, decisions because um, and that was, um, um, there are a number of STB decisions that have quite clearly um, um, ruled that rail bank corridor um, it can be used for other compatible uses. So trail use has to be one requirement um, for a rail bank corridor. You can't rail bank a corridor without trail use, but the STB has also ruled that you can rail bank a corridor um, that is a rail with trail for example, transit and trail use, or utility with trail, or in the case of the east side corridor that was the subject of one of the uh, Washington State cases that I talked, that was a trail, transit, and utility corridor. So um, the STB rules basically permit um, those compatible uses without harming the, um, the rail bank status of the corridor. The question is a little more complicated about whether or not we will see more challenges like the challenges brought against the east side corridors, utility and transit use. I think the Ninth Circuit's decision um, effectively rejects those challenges, but um, uh, it's possible that the class action lawyers that are um, bringing these challenges may attempt to bring other cases in other jurisdictions. We do know that a similar challenge was brought in South Carolina. Um, um, and um, unfortunately, the trail manager actually, we didn't know about that case until after the trail manager had actually settled with the class action lawyers and paid a um, million dollars um, to um, acquire the a quarter, um, uh, even though it was rail banked. 
to try to avoid that lawsuit. So if you know of any of these sorts of challenges, do let us know. Okay, and uh, here's a great question from, from uh, Don Noble that I think kind of gets at the root of this presentation. Um, and he asks, all things being equal, would you recommend rail banking or fee simple purchase to acquire a railroad corridor and why? I um, always recommend rail banking um, because all things are never equal. And um, even if the, if the corridor um, can be demonstrated to um, be owned by the railroad in fee simple, um, rail banking still gives you important protections from quiet title actions um, because adjacent landowners can sue you no matter what. And um, uh, so uh, it's it's the best insurance. Um, I and I don't want to, but I don't want to say that as a general rule. There could be circumstances where you know if the railroad owns a corridor clearly and fee simple. Um, title and you can get a title insurance company who can issue you title insurance, that would be sufficient protection from um, a legal challenge um, uh, 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 that would allow you to purchase without rail banking. And if you're really afraid of rail service reactivation, for example, um, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be potentially subject to rail, rail service re reactivation, which you, you would in the case of a rail bank corridor. Okay, um, and a question from Lauren Ledbetter. Um, she wants to know if in locations where a rail corridor has sections purchased in fee that would render a corridor impossible for reinstatement, is it possible to rail bank remaining parcels owned by the railroad versus purchasing those parcels in fee? I'm not sure if that question involves the question of rail corridor severance, because as I said, you know, the, whether the railroad owns the, a portion in fee versus an easement is irrelevant in rail banking. Um, so um, whatever the, the important thing is that the corridor be acquired intact and that a, an interim trail manager acquire the entirety of the corridor without any gaps. Um, gaps in a corridor could potentially threaten the rail bank status of a corridor. And, um, and, um, and that's because the surface transportation has ruled that, you know, one of the purposes of the rail banking program is to protect the national rail system. And if a corridor has become severed from the national rail system um, by virtue of uh, pieces that are not rail banked and that perhaps um, um, revert to adjacent landowners, then um, it might lose its or be denied rail bank status. I, and I don't know if that answers that question or not. All right, well, let's, let's move on to another question. And Lauren, uh, we'll keep an eye on this to see if you have any further clarification. Um, so I'm curious if you can comment so Courtney uh, Maronich Vida here asks if municipalities can rail bank, and they can, um, and actually they're eligible for fee waivers. So the SDB generally will waive um, the couple hundred dollar fees for all the filings that a municipality would normally have to pay, or, or any trail use proponent would normally have to pay. Um, but I'm curious to see if we can expand that to a question about sovereign immunity and what happens if states claim that they can't indemnify the railroad or accept the liability in the statement of willingness to assume financial responsibility um, and how they can uh, be comfortable trying to rail bank knowing that. So I, the, the, the thing, the STB has pretty clearly said that the interim trail manager has to execute the statement of willingness as it is written. Um, and I think some, um, 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 States and I think the state of Maryland was one of them, which argued that if some of the language in the statement of willingness um, would be problematic for purposes of its state comp, comp, uh, constitution um, um, because of their sovereign immunity. And uh, uh, it's my recollection that the STB said 
you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you just, you need to assume all 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 legal liability for this quarter. And you know, the reality is, if you're ha if you're if if you're immune from liability due to principles of sovereign immunity, then um, that's nobody's going to argue that um, um, that you should be liable, notwithstanding that principle. I don't I don't think that's never been the case. Nobody has ever um, argued, for example, that recreational use statutes don't apply, um, even though they limit the liability of any trail manager in the case of rail, rail, um, rail to trails conversions. What the rail banking law, it, the purpose of these, this statement of willingness is simply to say that the railroad doesn't have liability, and it's the railroad that must be relieved of liability. Um, and to the extent that there are legal protections against liability that some um, trail managers have um, that um, those protections are still available. But that's a sort of a long way around um, by saying that the STB will not let you uh, change the language in the statement of willingness um, to or modify it in a way to reflect um, lesser degrees of liability for governmental entities or any other type of trail sponsor. But I don't know of any cases where anybody has um, um, successfully argued that the trail manager um, is liable beyond their limitations under state law. Great, thank you. Um, and as expected, we've received a few questions about rail with trail. Um, and let's see here. Carol Brush asks if we're aware of instances where there are trails within an active but very lightly used rail corridor. And yes, we are. And we can point you to some of those um, examples offline. Um, and Tom Fister asks um, if there's any reason you can't have rail with trail if the rail uses cargo. And, and there really there really is, I mean, there are a host of, of maybe structural reasons or negotiating reasons why the railroad might not allow that, but we have definitely seen it done. Um, and then I also received a question offline from Gene Porter in New Hampshire that more generally had to do with liability issues related to rail with trail specifically. And I know that's not much of a question, that's just kind of a broad uh, outline, but I'm hoping you can give an overview on, on what's coming, moving forward with our rail with trail work. Sure. Um, uh, I will just say generally that in my view, um, the principle, liability principles um, in rails with trails context are no different um, than in a uh, trail that is not co-located um, near or adjacent to an active rail line. The same same liability protections and principles would apply that, um, including the protection of a recreational use statute. And um, uh, liability, though, is a huge issue um, involving rail with trail only because railroads are concerned about their liability and it is a big negotiating issue. And so there are a number of resources that are available um, uh, that um, show that rails with trails um, can be designed in a way and managed in a way that um, reduces risks of liability um, and um, and provides with provides um, the negotiating parties with um, a variety of legal reference points that will allow them to research their um, their state law liability and feel more comfortable with that. And those resources are available also on RTC's website. Um, we have done a report in 2013 um, on rails with trails. Um, and um, uh, you, so you can see it, it includes um, some state law resources as well, which includes a variety of um, uh, trail examples and and some best practices, and you can find that on our resource page on our on our website. And then, the Federal Highway Administration um, um, over a decade ago did a uh, best practices report as well, and it is currently in the process of updating it uh, so that um, when it is released, there will be a new report with um, some very substantial. Um, best practice type recommendations for on uh, that encompass a variety of topics relating to rail with trails, in, including um, very particularly design, design best practices, which are our most important, as well as some risk management strategies. 
Yeah, and I expect that RTC will take the lead on that the advocacy advocacy side of that report when it's released, and particularly the legal side. So you'll be seeing more resources from us in the hopefully a very near future. All right, so let's see. Um, Craig De La Pena um, had some advice about corridor negotiation, but um, I'm going to turn it into a question if you don't mind, Craig. Um, he uh, mentions the right of first refusal in Massachusetts. So I, I know that uh, applies in some states. Can you talk about um, how that may affect negotiating with the railroad um, if there's a right of first refusal in place? Yeah, hi, Craig. Good, good, <laughs> good point. And um, yeah, um, I do know that um, some states do have a right of first refusal, and that can be very helpful. And I'll, I'll just give you one example um, of a case that we have been involved in for the last 10 years involving the Harsimus embankment, which is a elevated um, uh, stone and uh, corridor on a stone embankment um, in Jersey City, New Jersey. And um, uh, in Jer New Jersey does have such a right of first refusal statute, and it um, and it basically says that a railroad, when it file in this in this particular case, says the railroad when it files an application for an abandonment should give the state must give the state a right of first refusal to acquire it, and um, and um, so, and I'm not sure. I don't know the Massachusetts statute. It's, it, I, I personally think it's important that any right of first refusal statutes in the, in, that the states enact should be um, pre-abandonment authorization um, in the sense that you want the state to be able to uh, be compelled to give a right of first refusal to um, the, um, the state um, before the abandonment becomes is consummated uh, so that so that the, it can be rail banked, but I, I think that the state laws vary. Okay, thank you very much, Andrea. Um, and I think um, there are definitely a ton more questions here, and and we'll work on a strategy for responding to you if we didn't get to it. Um, and we'll think if if we think some of these uh, the answers to these questions could be of use to other people on the call, we'll. Uh, consider a strategy to make those answers available to everyone. Um, but with that, I think we can call it a wrap. Um, you'll see our contact information on the screen in front of you. Uh, any un unanswered questions about the legal issues affecting rails to trails conversions can be emailed directly to Andrea. Uh, while any questions about the rail banking process, the trail expert network, or our webinar series can go to me. I want to thank everyone for their attendance and participation, and I hope you found this presentation informative and useful as you continue to manage, promote, or support your trail. Again, you'll be receiving a follow-up email shortly after this webinar with a link to the recorded version and a feedback survey, and we would really appreciate it if you would take the time to fill it out as it helps inform future webinar topics. And with that, thanks again, everyone, for attending. We hope you join us for another webinar in the near future. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>